Kia ora te whanau. I truly hope you're well and ready to go for chapter 7, in which a number of people arrive at the royal mansion. Charmaine had rather a disturbed night. Some of this was certainly due to Memoirs of an Exorcist, whose author had clearly been very busy among a lot of haunts and weirdities, all of which he described in a matter-of-fact way that left Charmaine in no doubt that ghosts were entirely real and mostly very unpleasant. She spent a lot of the night shivering and wishing she knew how to turn on the light. Some of the disturbance was due to Waif, who was determined she had a right to sleep on Charmaine's pillow. But most of the disturbance was nerves, pure and simple, and the fact that Charmaine had no way of telling what the time was. She kept waking up, thinking, suppose I oversleep. She woke in gray dawn, hearing birds twittering somewhere, and almost decided to get up then. But somehow she fell asleep again, and when she woke next, it was in broad daylight. Help! she cried out and flung back the covers, accidentally flinging Waif onto the floor too, and stumbled across the room to find the good clothes she had put out specially. As she dragged on her best green skirt, the sensible thing to do came to her at last. Great Uncle William, she called out. How do I tell what time it is? Merely tap your left wrist, the kindly voice replied, and say, time, my dear. It struck Charmaine that the voice was fainter and weaker than it had been. She hoped it was simply that the spell was wearing off and not that Great Uncle William was getting weaker himself, wherever he was. Time, she said, tapping. She expected a voice, or more probably a clock, to appear. People in High Norland were great on clocks. Her own house had 17, including one in the bathroom. She had been vaguely surprised that Great Uncle William did not seem to have even one cuckoo clock somewhere, but she realized the reason for this when what happened was that she simply knew the time. It was eight o'clock. And it'll take me at least an hour to walk there, she gasped, ramming her hand, arms into her best silk blouse as she ran for the bathroom. She was more nervous than ever as she did her hair in there. Her reflection, with water trickling across it for some reason, looked terribly young with its hair and one rusty pigtail over its shoulder. He'll know I'm only a schoolgirl, she thought, but there was no time to dwell on it. Charmaine rushed out of the bathroom and back through the same door leftward and charged into the warm, tidy kitchen. There were now five laundry bags leaning beside the sink, but Charmaine had no time to bother about that. Waif scuttled toward her, whining piteously, and scuttled back to the fireplace, where the fire was still cheerfully burning. Charmaine was just about to tap the mantelpiece and ask for breakfast when she saw Waif's problem. Waif was now too small to get her tail anywhere near the fireplace, so Charmaine tapped and said, Dog food, please, before asking for breakfast for herself. As she sat at the cleared table hurrying through her breakfast, while Waif briskly cleaned up the dog dish at her feet, Charmaine could not help grudgingly thinking that it was much nicer having the kitchen clean and tidy. I suppose Peter has his uses, she thought, pouring herself a last cup of coffee. But then she felt she ought to tap her wrist again, and she knew it was now six minutes to nine and jumped up in a panic. How did I take so long, she said out loud and raced to her bedroom for her smart jacket. Perhaps because she was putting on the jacket as she ran, she somehow turned the wrong way through the door and found herself in a very peculiar place. It was a long, thin room with pipes running everywhere around it, and in the middle, a large, trickling tank, mystifyingly covered in blue fur. Oh, bother, Charmaine said and backed out through the door. She found herself back in the kitchen. At least I know the way from here, she said diving through into the living room and ran running for the front door. Outside, she nearly tripped over a crock of milk, which must have been meant for Rollo. And he doesn't deserve it, she said, as she shut the front door with the slam. Down the front path, she raced between beheaded hydrangeas and out through the gate, which shut with a clash behind her. Then she managed to slow down because it was silly to try to run however many miles it was to the royal mansion, 
but she went down the road at a very brisk walk indeed, and she had just got to the first bend when the garden gate went clash again behind her. Charmaine whirled round. Waif was running after her, pattering as fast as her little legs would take her. Charmaine sighed and marched back toward her. Seeing her coming, Waif gambled delightedly and made tiny squeaks of pleasure. No, Waif, Charmaine said. You can't come. Go home. She pointed sternly toward Great Uncle William's house. Home! Waif drooped both ears and sat up and begged. No, Charmaine commanded, pointing again. Go home! Waif dropped to the ground and became a miserable white lump and with just the tip of her tail wagging. Oh, honestly, Charmaine said. And since Waif seemed determined not to budge from the middle of the road, Charmaine was forced to pick her up and rush back to Great Uncle William's house with her. I can't take you with me, she explained breathlessly as they went. I've got to see the king, and people just don't take dogs to see the king. She opened Great Uncle William's front gate and dumped Waif on the garden path. There, now stay. She shut the gate on Waif's reproachful face and strode off down the road again. As she went, she tapped her wrist anxiously and said, Time? But she was outside Great Uncle William's grounds then, and the spell did not work. All Charmaine knew was that it was getting later. She broke into a trot. Behind her, the gate clashed again. Charmaine looked back to see Waif once more running after her. Charmaine groaned, whirled round, raced to meet Waif, scooped her up, and dumped her back inside the gate. Now be a good dog and stay, she panted, rushing off again. The gate clashed behind her, and Waif once more came pelting after her. I shall scream, Charmaine said. She turned back and dumped Waif inside the gate for the third time. Stay there, you silly little dog. This time, she set off toward town at a run. Behind her, the gate clashed yet again. Tiny footsteps pattered in the road. Charmaine whirled round and ran back toward Waif, crying out, Oh, blast you, Waif! I shall be so late! This time, she picked Waif up and carried her toward the town, panting out, All right, you win. I shall have to take you because I'll be late if I don't. But I don't want you, Waif. Don't you understand? Waif was delighted. She squirmed upward and licked Charmaine's chin. No, stop that, Charmaine said. I'm not pleased. I hate you. You're a real nuisance. Keep still or I'll drop you. Waif settled into Charmaine's arms with a sigh of contentment. Oh, Charmaine said as she hurried on. As she rounded the huge bulge of cliff, Charmaine had meant to check upward in case the Lubbock, Lubbock came plunging down at her from the meadow above, but by then she was in such a hurry that she clean forgot about the Lubbock and simply jog-trotted onward. And, greatly to her surprise, the town was almost in front of her when she came round the bend. She had not remembered it was so near. There were the houses and towers, rosy and twinkling in the morning sun, only a stone's throw away. I think Aunt Sempronio's pony made a meal of this journey, Charmaine thought, as she strode in among the first houses. The road dived in across the river and became a dirty town street. Charmaine thought she remembered that this end of town was rather rough and unpleasant and marched on fast and nervously. But although most of the people she passed seemed quite poor, none of them seemed to notice Charmaine particularly, or if they did, they only noticed Waif peeping out enthusiastically from Charmaine's arms. Pretty little dog, remarked a woman, carrying strings of onions to market as Charmaine strode by. Pretty little monster, Charmaine said. The woman looked very surprised. Wave squirmed protestingly. Yes, you are, Charmaine told her as they began to come among wider streets and smarter houses. You're a bully and a blackmailer, and if you've made me late, I shall never forgive you. As they reached the marketplace, the big clock on the town hall struck ten o'clock, and Charmaine went suddenly from needing to hurry to wondering how she was going to stretch ten minutes' walk into half an hour. The royal mansion was practically just round the corner from here. At least she could slow down and get cool. By now the sun had burned through the mist from the mountains, and what with that and Waif's warm body, Charmaine was decidedly hot. 
She took a detour along the esplanade that ran high above the river, rushing swift and brown on its way down to the great valley beyond the town, and dropped to a saunter. Three of her favorite bookshops were on this road. She pushed her way among other sauntering people and looked eagerly into windows. Nice little dog, several people said as she went. <laughs> Charmaine said to the waif. Fat lot they know. She arrived in Royal Square as the big clock there began to chime the half hour. Charmaine was pleased. But as she crossed the square to the booming of the clock, she was somehow not pleased and not hot anymore either. She was cold and small and insignificant. She knew she had been stupid to come. She was a fool. They would take one look at her and send her away. The flashing of the golden tiles on the roof of the royal mansion daunted her completely. She was glad of Waif's small, warm tongue licking her chin again. By the time she was climbing the steps to the heavy front door of the mansion, she was so nervous that she almost turned round and ran away. But she told herself firmly that this was the one thing in the world she really wanted to do, even though I'm not sure I do want to now, she thought. And everyone knows that those tiles are only tin enchanted to look like gold, she added, and she lifted the great gold-painted knocker and bravely hammered on the door with it. Then her knees threatened to fold under her, and she wondered if she could run away. She stood there quivering and clutching Waif hard. The door was opened by an old, old serving man, probably the butler, Charmaine thought, wondering where she had seen the old man before. I must have passed him in town on my way to school, she thought. Uh, uh, she said, I'm Charmaine Baker. The king wrote me a letter. She let go of Waif with one hand in order to fetch the letter out of her pocket. But before she could get at it, the old butler held the door wide open. Please to come in, Miss Charmaine, he said in a quavery old voice. His majesty is expecting you. Charmaine found herself entering the royal mansion on legs that wobbled almost as badly as the old butler's did. He was so stooped with age that his face was on a level with Waif as Charmaine wobbled in past him. He stopped her with a shaky old hand. Please to keep tight hold on the little dog, miss. It wouldn't do to have it wandering about here. Charmaine discovered herself to be babbling. I do hope it's all right to bring her. She would keep following me, you see, and in the end I had to pick her up and carry her, or I'd have been perfectly all right, miss, the butler said, heaving the great door shut. His majesty is very fond of dogs. Indeed, he has bitten, bit, been bitten several times, trying to make friends with, well, the fact of the matter is, miss, that our Rajputi cook owns a dog that is not at all a nice creature. It has been known to slay other dogs when they impinge upon its territory. Oh, dear, Charmaine said weakly. Precisely, said the old butler. If you will follow me, miss... Waif squirmed in Charmaine's arms because Charmaine was clutching her so tightly as she followed the butler along a broad stone corridor. It was cold inside the mansion and rather dark. Charmaine was surprised to find that there were no ornaments anywhere and almost no hint of royal grandeur unless you counted one or two large brown pictures in dingy old gold frames. There were big pale squares on the walls every so often where pictures had been taken away. But Charmaine was by now so nervous that she did not wonder about this. She just became colder and thinner and more and more unimportant until she felt she must be about the size of Waif. The butler stopped and creakily pushed open a mighty square oak door. Your Majesty, Miss Charming Baker, he announced, and dog. Then he doddered away. Charmaine managed to dodder into the room. The shakiness must be catching, she thought, and did not dare curtsy in case her knees collapsed. The room was a vast library. Dim brown shelves of books stretched away in both directions. The smell of old book, which Charmaine normally loved, was almost overpowering. Straight in front of her was a great oak table piled high with more books and stacks of old yellow papers, and some newer, whiter paper at the near end. There were three big carved chairs at that end, 
arranged around a very small charcoal fire in an iron basket. The basket sat on a kind of iron tray, which in turn sat on an almost worn out carpet. Two old people sat in two of the carved chairs. One was a big old man with a nicely trimmed white beard and, when Charmaine dared to look at him, kindly crinkled old blue eyes. She knew he had to be the king. Come here, my dear, he said to her, and take a seat. Put the little dog down near the fire. Charmaine managed to do as the king said. Waif, to her relief, seemed to realize that one must be on one's best behavior here. She sat gravely down on the carpet and politely quivered her tail. Charmaine sat on the edge of the carved chair and quivered all over. Let me make my daughter known to you, said the king. Princess Hilda. Princess Hilda was old, too. If Charmaine had not known she was the king's daughter, she might have thought the princess and the king were the same age. The main difference between them was that the princess looked twice as royal as the king. She was a big lady like her father, with very neat iron-gray hair, and a tweed suit, so plain and tweed-colored that Charmaine knew it was a highly aristocratic suit. Her only ornament was a big ring on one veiny old hand. That is a very sweet little dog, she said in a firm and forthright voice. What is her name? Waif, your highness, Charmaine faltered. And have you had her long? The princess asked. Charmaine could tell that the princess was making conversation in order to set her at ease, and that made her more ner nervous than ever. No, uh, er, that is, she said, the fact is she was a stray, or uh, Great Uncle William said she was, and she can't have had, he could, can't have had her long because he he didn't know she was, or, uh, uh, but I, or, I mean, a girl, William Norland, you know, the, the wizard. The king and the princess both said, oh, at the same time, and the king said, are you related to Wizard Norland then, my dear? Our great friend, added the princess. I, uh, he's my aunt Sempronia's great uncle, really, Charmaine confessed. Somehow the atmosphere became much more friendly. The king said rather longingly, I suppose you have had no news of how Wizard Norland is yet? Charmaine shook her head. I'm afraid not, your majesty, but he did look awfully ill when the, well, when the elves took him away. Not to be wondered at, stated Princess Hilda. Poor William. Now, Miss Baker. Oh, oh, please call me Charmaine, Charmaine stand, stammered. Very well, the princess agreed. But we must get down to business now, child, because I shall have to leave you soon to attend to my first guest. My daughter is sparing you an hour or so, the king said, to explain to you what we do here in the library and how you may best assist us. This is because we gathered from your handwriting that you were not very old, which we see is the case, and so probably inexperienced. He gave Charmaine the most enchanting smile. We really are most grateful to you for your offer to help, my dear. No one has ever considered that we might need assistance before. Charmaine felt her face feeling, filling with heat. She knew she was blushing horribly. My pleasure, your, she managed to mutter. Pull your chair over to the table, Princess Hilda interrupted, and we'll get down to work. As Charmaine got up and dragged the heavy chair over, the king said courteously, We hope you may not be too hot in here with the brazier beside you. It may be summer now, but we old people feel the cold these days. Charmaine was still frozen with nerves. Not at all, sire, she said. And Waif is at least happy, the king said, pointing a gnarly finger. Waif had rolled over onto her back with all four paws in the air and was basking in the heat from the brazier. She seemed far happier than Charmaine was. To work, father, the princess said severely. She fetched up the glasses hanging from a chain round her neck and planted them on her, on her aristocratic nose. The king fetched up a pair of pince-nez. Charmaine fetched up her own glasses. 
If she had not been so nervous, she would have wanted to giggle at the way they all had to do this. Now, said the princess, we have in this library books, papers, and parchment scrolls. After a lifetime of labor, father and I have managed to list ha roughly half the books, by name and author's name, and assigned each a number, together with a brief account of what is in each book. Father will continue doing this while you make yourself responsible for my main task, which is to catalog papers and scrolls. I have barely made a start there, I'm afraid. Here's my list. She opened a large folder full of sheets of paper covered in elegant, spidery writing and spread a row of them in front of Charmaine. As you see, I have several main headings. Family letters, household accounts, historic writings, and so on. Your task is to go through each pile of paper and decide exactly what every sheet contains. You then write a description of it, of it under the appropriate heading, after which you put the paper carefully in one of these labeled boxes here. Is this clear so far? Charmaine, leaning forward to look at the beautifully written lists, was afraid that she seemed awfully stupid. What do I do, she asked, if I find a paper that doesn't fit any of your headings, ma'am? A very good question, Princess Hilda said. We are hoping that you will find a great many things that do not fit. When you do find one, consult my father at once in case the paper is important. If it isn't, put it in the box marked miscellaneous. Now, here's your first packet of papers. I'll watch as you go through them to see how you go on. There is your paper. There is paper for your lists. Pen and ink are here. Please start. She pushed a frayed brown packet of letters tied together with pink tape in front of Charmaine and sat back to watch. I've never known anything so off-putting, Charmaine thought. She tremulously unpicked the pink knot and tried spreading the letters out a little. Pick each one up by its opposite corners, Princess Hilda said. Don't push them. Oh, dear, Charmaine thought. She glanced sideways at the king who had taken up a wilted-looking soft leather book and was leafing carefully through it. I'd hoped to be doing that, she thought. She sighed and carefully opened the first crumbly brown letter. My dearest, gorgeous, wonderful darling, she read. I miss you so hideously, um, she said to Princess Hilda. Is there a special box for love letters? Yes, indeed, said the princess. This one. Record the date and the name of the person who wrote it. Who was it, by the way? Charmaine looked up onto the end of the letter. Um, it says, Big Dolphy. Both the king and the princess said, Well, and laughed the king most heartily. Then they are from my father to my mother, Princess Hilda said. My mother died many years ago, but never mind that. Write it on your list. Charmaine looked at the crumbly brown state of the paper and thought it must have been many years ago. She was surprised that the king did not seem to mind her reading it, but neither he nor the princess seemed in the least worried. Perhaps royal people are different, she thought, looking at the next letter. It began, Dearest Chuffy Puffy One. Oh, well. She got on with her task. After a while, the princess stood up and pushed her chair neatly up to the table. This seems quite satisfactory, she stated. I must go. My guests will be arriving soon. I still wish I had been able to ask that husband of hers too, father. Out of the question, my dear, the king said, without looking up from the notes he was making. Poaching. He's someone else's royal wizard. Oh, I know, Princess Hilda said, but I am also aware that Ingery has two royal wizards, and our poor William is ill and may be dying. Life is never fair, my dear the king said, still scratching away with his quill pen. Besides, William had no more success than we have had. I'm aware of that too, father, Princess Hilda said as she left the library. The door shut with the heavy thud behind her. Charmaine bent over her next pile of papers, trying to look as if she had not been listening. It seemed private. This pile of papers had been tied into a bundle for so long that each sheet had stuck to the next one, all dry and brownish. 
like a wasp's nest Charmaine had once found in the attic at home. She became very busy trying to separate the layers. Ahem, <clears throat> said the king. Charmaine looked up to see that he was smiling at her with his quill in the air and a sideways twinkle at her from above his glasses. I see you are a very discreet young lady, he said, and you must have gathered from our talk just now that we, and your great uncle with us, are searching for some very important things. My daughter's headings will give you some clue what to look out for. Your key words will be treasury, revenues, gold, and elf gift. If you find a mention of any of these, my dear, please tell me at once. The idea of looking for such important things made Charmaine's fingers on the frail paper go all cold and clumsy. Yes, yes, of course, your majesty, she said. Rather to her relief, that packet of papers was nothing but lists of goods and their prices, all of which seemed surprisingly low. To ten pounds of wax candles at two pennies a pound, twenty pence, she read. Well, it did seem to date from two hundred years ago. To six ounces of finest saffrons, saffron, thirty pence. To nine logs of fragrant applewood for the scenting of the chief chambers, one farthing, and so on. The next page was full of things like, to forty ells of linen drapes, forty-four shillings. Charmaine made careful notes, put those pages in the box labeled household accounts, and peeled up the next sheet. Oh, she said. The next sheet said, to Wizard Melicott, for the enchanting of one hundred square feet of tin tilings to give the appearance of a golden roof, two hundred guineas. What is it, my dear? the king asked, putting his finger on his place in his book. Charmaine read the ancient bill out to him. He chuckled and shook his head a little. So it was definitely done by magic, was it? he said. I must confess I had always hoped it would turn out to be real gold, hadn't you? Yes, but it looks gold, anyhow, Charmaine said, consolingly. And a very good spell, too, to last two hundred years, the king said, nodding. Expensive as well. Two hundred guineas was a lot of money in those days. Ah, oh, well, I never did hope to solve our financial problems that way. Besides, it would look shocking if we climbed up and stripped all the tiles off the roof. Keep looking, my dear. Charmaine kept looking, but all she found was someone charging two guineas to plant a rose garden and someone else getting paid ten guineas to refurbish the treasury. No, not someone else. The same wizard Melicott who did the roof. Melicott was a specialist, I fancy, the king said when Charmaine had read this out. Looks to me like a fellow who went in for faking precious metals. The treasury was certainly empty by that date. I've known my crown was a fake for years. Must be this Melicott's work. Are you getting peckish at all, my dear? A bit cold and stiff? We don't bother with regular lunch. My daughter doesn't hold with it, but I generally ask the butler to bring in a snack around this time. Why not get up and stretch your legs while I ring the bell? Charmaine stood up and walked about, causing Waif to roll to her feet and watch inquiringly. While the king lim limped over to the bell rope by the door, he was decidedly frail, Charmaine thought, and very tall. It was as if his height was too much for him. While they waited for someone to answer the bell, Charmaine seized the chance to look at the books in the shelves. They seemed to be books about everything. Higgledy-piggledy, travel books next to books of algebra, and poems rubbing shoulders with geography. Charmaine had just opened one called Secrets of the Universe Revealed when the library door opened and a man in a tall cook's hat came in, carrying a tray. To Charmaine's surprise, the king nimbly skipped behind the table. My dear, pick up your dog, he called out urgently. Another dog had come in, pressed close to the cook's legs as if it felt unsafe. A bitter-looking brown dog with gnarly ears and a ratty tail. It was growling as it came. Charmaine had no doubt that this was the dog that slew other dogs, and she dived to pick Waif up. But Waif somehow slipped through her hands and went trotting toward the cook's dog. 
The other dog's growls increased to a snarl. Bristles rose along its haggard brown back. It looked so menacing that Charmaine did not dare go any nearer to it. Waif, however, seemed to feel no fear. She went right up to the snarling dog in her jauntiest way, raised herself on her tiny hind legs, and cheekily dabbed her nose on its nose. The other dog started back, so surprised that it stopped snarling. Then it pricked up its lumpy ears and, very cautiously, nosed Waif in return. Waif gave an excited squeak and frisked. Next second, both dogs were gambling delightedly all over the library. Well, said the king, I suppose that's all right. Then, what is the meaning of this, Jamal? Why are you here instead of Sim? Jamal, who had only one eye, Charmaine noticed, came and apologetically put his tray down on the table. Our princess has taken Sim away to receive the guest, sire, he explained, leaving no one to but me to bring food. And my dog would come, I think. I think, he added, watching the two prancing dogs, that my dog has never enjoyed life until now. He bowed to Charmaine. Please bring your small white dog here again often, Miss Charming. He whistled to his dog. It pretended not to hear. He went to the door and whistled again. Food, he said. Come for Squid. This time both dogs came, and to Charmaine's surprise and dismay, Waif went trotting out of the door beside the cook's dog, and the door shut after both of them. Not to worry the king said. They seem to be friends. Jamal will bring her back. Very reliable fellow, Jamal. If it wasn't for that dog of his, he'd be the perfect cook. Let's see what he's brought us, shall we? Jamal had brought a jug of lemonade and a platter piled with crisp brown things under a white cloth. The king said, ah, as he eagerly lifted the cloth, have one while they're hot, my dear. Charmaine did so. One bite was enough to assure her that Jamal was an even better cook than her father, and Mr. Baker was renowned for being the best cook in town. The brown things were crunchy, but soft at the same time, with a rather, with a rather hot taste that Charmaine had never met before. They made you need the lemonade. She and the king polished off the whole platterful between them and drank all the lemonade. Then they got back to work. By this time, they were on extremely friendly terms. Charmaine now had no shyness about asking the king anything she wanted to know. Why would they need two bushels of rose petals, sire? She asked him, and the king answered, They liked them underfoot in the dining saloon in those days. Messy habit, to my mind. Listen to what this philosopher has to say about camels, my dear. And she read out, he read out a page from his book that made them both laugh. The philosopher had clearly not got on with camels. Quite a long time later, the library door opened and Waif trotted in, looking very pleased with herself. She was followed by Jamal. Message from our princess, sire, he said. The lady has settled in and Sim is taking tea to the front parlor. Ah, said the king. Crumpets? Muffins, too. Jamal said and went away. The king banged his sh book shut and stood up. I had better go and greet our guest, he said. I'll go on with the bills then, Charmaine said. I'll make a pile of the ones I want to ask about. No, no, said the king. You come too, my dear. Bring the little dog. Helps break the ice, you know. This lady is my daughter's friend. Never met her myself. Charmaine at once felt highly nervous again. She had found Princess Hilda thoroughly intimidating and much too royal for comfort, and any friend of hers was likely to be just as bad. But she could hardly refuse, when the king was expectantly holding the door open for her. Waif was already trotting after him. Charmaine felt forced to get up and follow. The front parlor was a large room, full of faded sofas with slightly frayed arms and rather ragged fringes. There were more pale squares on the walls where pictures must once have hung. 
The biggest pale square was over the grand marble fireplace where, to Charmaine's relief, a cheerful fire was burning. The parlor, like the library, was a cold room, and Charmaine had gone cold with nerves again. Princess Hilda was sitting bolt upright on a sofa beside the fireplace, where Sim had just pushed a large tea trolley. As soon as she saw Sim pushing a trolley, Charmaine knew where she had seen Sim before. It was when she had got lost beside the conference room and had that glimpse of the old man pushing a trolley along a strange corridor. That's odd, she thought. Sim was in the act of shaking, shakily placing a plate of buttered crumpets in the hearth. At the sight of those crumpets, Waif's nose, nose quivered and she made a dash toward them. Charmaine was only just in time to catch her. As she stood up, holding the wriggling way firmly in both arms, the princess said, Ah, my father, the king. Everyone else in the parlor stood up. Father, said the princess, may I introduce my great friend, Mrs. Sophie Pendragon? The king strode limpingly forward, holding out his hand and making the large room look quite a little smaller. Charmaine had not realized before quite how large he was, Quite as tall as those elves, she thought. Mrs. Pendragon, he said, delighted to meet you. Any friend of our daughter's is a friend of ours. Mrs. Pendragon surprised Charmaine. She was quite young, younger than the princess by a long way, and modishly dressed in a peacock blue that set off her red-gold hair and blue-green eyes to perfection. She's lovely, Charmaine thought, rather enviously. Mrs. Pendragon dropped the king a little curtsy as they shook hands and said, I'm here to do my best, sire. More I can't say. Quite right, quite right, the king replied. Please be seated again, everyone, and let's have some tea. Everyone sat down and a polite, courteous hum of conversation began while Sim doddered around giving out cups of tea. Charmaine felt a complete outsider. Feeling sure that she should not be here, she sat herself in the corner of the most distant sofa and tried to work out who the other people were. Me Waif, meanwhile, sat sedately on the sofa beside Charmaine, looking demure. Her eyes keenly followed the gentleman who was handing round the crumpets. This gentleman was so quiet and colorless that Charmaine forgot what he looked like as soon as she took her eyes off him and had to look at him again to remind herself. The other gentleman, the one whose mouth looked closed, even when he was talking, she gathered was the king's chancellor. He seemed to have a lot of secretive things to say to Mrs. Pendragon, who kept nodding and then blinking a bit, as if what the chancellor said surprised her. The other lady, who was elderly, seemed to be Princess Hilda's lady-in-waiting and very good at talking about the weather. And I shouldn't be surprised if it didn't rain again tonight, she was saying, as the colorless gentleman arrived beside Charmaine and offered her a crumpet. Waif's nose swiveled yearningly to follow the plate. Oh, thanks, Charmaine said, pleased that he had not forgotten her. Take two, suggested the colorless gentleman. His Majesty will certainly eat any that are left over. The king at that moment was eating two muffins, one squashed on top of the other, and watching the crumpets as eagerly as Waif was. Charmaine thanked the gentleman again and took two. They were the most buttery crumpets she had ever encountered. Waif's nose swiveled to dab gently against Charmaine's hand. All right, all right, Charmaine muttered, trying to break off a piece without dripping butter on the sofa. Butter ran down her fingers and threatened to trickle up her sleeves. She was trying to get rid of it on her handkerchief when the lady-in-waiting finished saying all anyone could possibly say about the weather and turned to Mrs. Pendragon. Princess Hilda tells me you have a charming little boy, she said. Yes, Morgan, Mrs. Pendragon said. She seemed to be having trouble with butter, too, and was mopping her fingers with her handkerchief and looking flustered. How old will Morgan be now, Sophie? Princess Hilda asked. When I saw him, he was just a baby. Oh, nearly two, Mrs. Pendragon replied, catching a big golden drip of butter before it fell on her skirt. I left him with... 
the door of the parlor opened. Through it came a small, fat toddler in a grubby blue suit with tears rolling down his face. Mama, Mom! He was wailing as he staggered into the room. But as soon as he saw Mrs. Pendragon, his face spread into a blinding smile. He stretched out both arms and rushed to her, where he buried his face in her skirt. Mom! He shouted. Following him through the door came floating an agitated-looking blue creature shaped like a long teardrop with a face on the front of it. It seemed to be made of flames. It brought a gust of warmth with it and a gasp from everyone in the room. An even more agitated housemaid hurried in after it. After the housemaid came a small boy, quite the most angelic child Charmaine had ever seen. He had a mass of blonde curls that clustered around his angelic pink and white face. His eyes were big and blue and bashful. His exquisite little chin rested on a frill of white, white lace, and the rest of his graceful little body was clothed in a pale blue velvet suit with big silver buttons. His pink rosebud mouth spread into a shy smile as he came in, showing a charming dimple in his delicate little cheek. Charmaine could not think why Mrs. Pendragon was staring at him in such horror. He was surely a truly enchanting child, and what long, curly eyelashes! With my husband and his fire demon, Mrs. Pendragon finished. Her face had gone fiery red, and she glared at the little boy across the toddler's head. My love to you all, Fano. See you again soon.